Welcome to the show. On today's podcast, we have four-time best-selling author, integrative dietitian, and high-performance coach, Esther Blum. She beat mercury and mold toxicity, battled Epstein-Barr virus, and debilitating insomnia. Her training and expertise have enabled her to coach people to eliminate the need for medication, optimize gut health, balance her hormones, and reverse chronic illness. She has helped thousands of women identify and fix the root cause of their health issues and balance their hormones once and for all. So in today's episode, we'll be talking about hormones, gut health, and being your own advocate when it comes to your health. Enjoy. Hi, Esther. Thank you so much for being with us here today. Hey, Kat. Thanks for having me. So before we get started, let's start with you. Tell us a little bit about your journey and how you got to where you are now helping women with their health and nutrition. So uh, I grew up in a family of physicians. So I was surrounded by my grandfather, who was an ENT surgeon, and my father, um, and who was a dermatologist. My mother was a nurse. My grandmother was an anesthesiologist. So I was really surrounded by health and wellness and um, really giving back to the community and, you know, people doing house calls. So a really old fashioned medical family. And so, um, you know, science came very naturally to me. And when it came, came time for me in college to declare a major, I didn't uh, want to go to medical school. I didn't want to be a doctor, but I loved the science requirements of nutrition, which is basically a pre-med degree minus the physics and just a little less chemistry. So it was really a great fit for me. And um, the first five years of my career were spent working in hospitals and having about 10 minutes to give someone diet instruction before they were discharged from the hospital. So I really wanted to shift my focus to something much more preventative uh, and get into people early on in their age so that their aging process could really be optimized. So I went and became credentialed in functional medicine and really haven't looked back and have had a beautiful private practice. And uh, I'm working on my fifth book to really teach people what they need to heal, how to navigate through the medical system how to uh, listen, you use the wisdom of their body to pursue the best treatments for them, which is often a combination of testing, supplements, diet, lifestyle, not necessarily in that order, um, and really treating the whole person. So you are an integrative dietitian. Can you explain how that's different from maybe a traditional Western approach? So I have a bachelor's and a master's in clinical nutrition. And when you're studying as a, to become a clinical dietitian, you're given a more traditional, which I feel is an antiquated education. You're really taught the most basic of basics, um, you know, when I was in school, I mean, to date myself a little bit, like the low fat diet was a thing. Uh, then it was, you know, Dean Ornish, which is like super high carb, super low fat diet, which no human should or can sustain <laughs> for long periods of time. Um, you were taught you don't need supplements. You can get all your nutrients from food. Um, and you weren't really taught the healing diets you were kind of taught everything in moderation or, you know, but even to this day, right, I get many different medical journals um, and I get today's dietitian, uh, which advocates, you know, that you don't have to go gluten free to feel better, um, that canola and soybean oil are good for you, everything in moderation versus my functional medicine journals, which talk about the healing powers of turmeric for inflammation, that it's, you know, a thousand times better than any traditional painkiller you get in the market and really goes into therapeutic diet. So that's what my functional medicine training was, was you, it was all the studies. I was so pissed when I did that training. I was like, where were these studies in my, um, you know, six years of, of undergraduate and graduate? Why do I have these enormous student loans and learn none of these things 
where I literally took a course in grad school called Vitamins and Minerals. And the professor said, you don't need any supplements. Everything you need is from your diet. Versus my functional medicine training, where you learn about how to uh, treat autoimmune conditions through a paleo diet. We, you learn about um, the benefits of fasting. You learn about, well, back in the day, it was called the specific carbohydrate diet, which was started by Elaine Gottschall. Now it's more evolved into the FODMAP diet. Um, but you learn how to treat really chronic medical conditions with diet, with supplements. And you also, I mean, now at this point, I do extensive testing in my practice. I treat, I do gut testing. I do extensive hormone testing. I look at neurotransmitters in the brain and um, I do far more extensive blood testing as well. So much so that a lot of doctors say, I'm not going to do these tests. And I have to call the office and say, no, this is why, you know, this human needs these tests from you. So it's a very different approach, but it works much more in depth and it's a permanent solution to your problems versus, you know, every day, I mean, just this morning, you know, my calendar was filled with people wanting to book calls with me and at least four, I, let's say I got 10 just this morning, at least four of them say, my doctor doesn't listen to anything I say. My doctor doesn't believe me. My doctor won't do anything about my medical condition. So the average person who comes to me has been to five to 10 doctors before me or just been gaslit and told um, diet doesn't matter or, oh, your stomach hurts, you have irritable bowel syndrome, or you don't need hormones, even though you're hot flashing and have severe insomnia at night and have vaginal dryness and no libido. So you're not, you know, the traditional medical model is treating symptoms. It's treating single organ systems, not connecting the whole puzzle, the whole person um, and it's treating with drugs, which drugs have time and place. Listen, we've all benefited from modern medicine. God bless surgeons who can like really surgically fix things that are broken, like bones and things like that. But when it comes to long-term prevention, when it comes to root causes, and when it comes to taking the whole person into account, that is where functional medicine really fills the gap quite beautifully. And you know, I see people who have severe uh, stomach pain all the time and will explore their history of sexual abuse. And lo and behold, they have horrible trauma and sexual abuse. And we work on, you know, of course, I work with psychologists who deal with trauma work and refer out to that. But, you know, you a, a regular doctor might not delve in deep. They might not understand the connection with trauma and illness like Hashimoto's is another autoimmune condition often expressed after a traumatic event, a divorce, abuse, a death. Um, so, you know, you really, you, you have to have a lot of um, listening skills to put the pieces together. You have to know kind of which test to run or which direction you take. Not everyone needs diet therapy if you, if you haven't dealt with your trauma first, deal with the trauma first. Because no amount of diet or supplements will fix that. You have to but again, so I, I love putting the pieces together. I love, you know, learning who my clients are as humans and being able to tailor and address a whole plan for their needs, not just diet, not just supplements, but the whole person. Yeah, I remember a while back they had gotten rid of in Florida nutritionists. Like you can't be a nutritionist anymore. You have to be a registered dietitian. Mm -hmm. So I had looked into that and I actually went to the school, talked to the professors. What do you teach? What's how does it work? And they were they had classes on making uh, artificial ingredients uh, more mm -hmm. addictive, taste better. I mean, this is what they're teaching people for diet. I mean, it was it just blew my mind, and I was just like, "How is this allowed?" <laughs> so obviously, I did not want anything to do with that. And unfortunately, in Florida, you have to be a dietitian if you want to do any sort of nutrition advice, even to be a functional nutritionist. So it was just not like something I wanted to waste my time on. But yeah, I, I see that a lot. Like I've had a lot of nutritionists on and the good ones. They they always do additional training in functional medicine, all of them. They're always mm -hmm. like, that's just what I needed to be licensed. The rest I had to do on my own. Mm -hmm. That's it. It's been a real, it's a real labor of love. Um, but I'm so passionate about it because 
Our medical system is leaving people in horrible shape without answers, very frustrating, uh, very frustrated. And again, gaslit and our bodies are wise beyond measure and tell us everything we need to know. So when we're having clear symptoms, it's not in our heads. Um, this isn't, you know, some manufactured story. This is something that's really happening in your body. So the goal is to find someone who's going to listen to you, who's going to unearth what's happening and who's going to give you a strategic plan that works where you see results and you see the shift. And, um, it's profound when you have someone, you know, I've had plenty of patients who couldn't get out of bed, couldn't walk up the steps, couldn't uh, due to severe pain and arthritis and autoimmune conditions. And we're on heavy, heavy medications uh, like methotrexate and steroids. And then their doctor, or pardon me, they were on Plaquenil and steroids and their doctor wanted to put them on methotrexate. And then we work together. They lose 20 pounds. They're able to literally run up the step. They don't have to take three doses of Advil a day. They never go on methotrexate. You know, just everything functions better. Or I have another client who did beautifully. She couldn't eat more than like six foods when she came to me. It was like boiled chicken, canned peaches, a banana, um, maybe some rice, but she couldn't even touch veggies at all. And again, like no diagnosis at all. Went to a rheumatologist, was told she had a connective tissue disorder, but they couldn't isolate what it was. She was put on steroids. She blew up to 180 pounds. And this was a petite girl and just was absolutely devastated. And she also had severe digestive struggles where she was nervous to leave the house because like all hell broke loose. So again, we did testing. We looked at her gut health. We um, got the inflammation down. We, we cleaned up her autoimmune markers. We put on a very special diet and very slowly it took you know, six to 12 months, but very slowly we and incrementally, we were able to increase her food. She lost a good 30 pounds. This was during the pandemic when she was home alone doing like exercise. Uh, she was doing Dancing with the Stars videos <laughs> and she was able to expand her palate and we did really good detective work. We realized like the chicken breast she was having actually had gluten in it. So you think, oh, I'll buy a chicken breast. It's benign. But the way it was processed, it was either in contact with something that had gluten or the way the animal was fed, or somehow in the processing, it had gluten in. So we were really able to isolate all that, and she got so much better so quickly, which was, well, not quickly, quickly, but in the span of a lifetime, you know, six to 12 months is short. So she did beautifully. So it's all, you know, there's nothing in most people that's not treatable or reversible. You just have to find the right practitioner to unlock it. So what do you find are the biggest health problems that you get with women in your practice? Primarily the women who treat me are going through a hormonal storm, either perimenopause or menopause. And I treat people even in their 60s and 70s who are still having menopausal symptoms. They're still having hot flashes. So, um, and, and we eliminate them. And we get them sleeping again and we clear up their brain fog. So, um, you know, it's, I really help women through the whole thing. And I'm writing my fifth book on menopause for this very reason, because it, uh, women, you know, the majority of medical testing is done on men. The majority of drugs tested are on men. They're not on women. Um, I always say if menopause, like, you know, if this was a male issue, we'd have a million treatments for it, but because it's a female issue, you know, women are so underserved. Women of color are severely underserved, not listened to. Um, and your symptoms are real. This is a great story. I was talking to a prospective client the other day, and she said that her doctor uh, wanted to give her an IUD to get through her menopause, which birth control, you don't really need birth control in perimenopause and menopause because you're not really ovulating anyway. So you don't need something that's going to further suppress your progesterone, <laughs> which is a rock star through your menopausal journey. So her doctor wanted to put her on IUD and the doctor herself admitted that she was having severe insomnia and took Benadryl every night to sleep. So it really shows us like our poor doctors aren't even trained to be equipped to handle all of this. 
So there's a viable need out there. I was just talking to my gynecologist the other day and she was like, how come you don't have a primary doctor? And I'm like, every time I go to one, I walk in, I look at them and I'm like, this person cannot help me. They look Mm. ill. They look like they barely can help themselves. Yeah. Yes, that's true too. Yes. Um, And you see it too. A lot of my mom was a nurse and a lot of the nurses were really obese and not taking great care of themselves even though they're like the most amazing caregivers. And this is, this is not to do- not doctors. I honestly, like there's so many amazing caregivers in this world. They go into medicine truly altruistic and wanting to help people. It's just the training is so deficient. So I, I did a post um, about this on Instagram saying, you know, if, you're, if your doctor isn't helping your symptoms or listening to you or doing the lab test you want, go find a new doctor. And there was a nutritionist or a a dietitian who's married to a doctor who got extraordinarily offended and wrote a whole email. I find this so offensive. And my husband is, you know, training uh, so many hours. I was like, dude, I work full time. I run a full time medical practice by myself. I handle soup to nuts, the the admin work, the testing, the treatment of a lot of humans and I have a family, okay, and a dog. And guess what? I don't care how busy you are. You have time to read uh, three or four research papers when you're sitting on the toilet in the morning. You have time to listen to a podcast when you're working out. You have time to listen to a lecture. So don't tell me you don't have the time. You have to have the desire to serve your patients. And if I was a doctor, and this is how I began serving menopausal women. I knew nothing about menopause years ago. And guess what? My patients kept saying, I'm going through menopause. I'm going through menopause. I'm go-. And I was like, well, shoot, I don't know anything about this. I better start educating myself. And I spent hours every week listening to podcasts, listening to webinars, going to trainings and making that just a part of my day, a part of my week, a part of my life. Because If you really want to serve your people, you darn well better learn what they're asking you. If you get the same question more than three times, go learn about it. It's your duty. If you're an intelligent human, you can actually learn things pretty quickly. It doesn't take tons and tons of time. Um, Where I've spent the most time training is, uh, fortunately, I have many doctors at labs where I do my tests who will sit and explain the tests and the treatments so we can come up with really powerful protocol, but it protocols, but it, it does, it takes years and years to get where you are. And most of what I learn is not in books, which makes it even harder. Yeah. So one of the problems that you touched upon in the beginning was when women go to their doctors, they have all these symptoms and their doctors is like, okay, yeah, you're fine. Cause your labs are fine. So you have to be fine. <laughs> so what is going on? Why are the labs saying you're fine when you don't feel fine. Yeah, you can still have totally normal labs and feel like complete dog poop. So, uh, you know, A, that that means the testing's not comprehensive. Usually by the time things are picked up on a blood test, you're pretty far gone. You know, an autoimmune condition just doesn't happen overnight. It's a a storm that has been building for years. You know, genetics are the gun, but the environment pulls the trigger. So uh, if you're not finding things on a blood test, um, either your testing's not complete or you may not be far enough along in your journey, right? So thyroid issues are a great example where someone will have Hashimoto's and I've helped a lot of people get diagnosed just by the testing I run. A traditional medical office will run a TSH, that's thyroid stimulating hormone. However, you need about six other thyroid tests and you need to look at your antibodies, your TPO, thyroid peroxidase um, antibodies, to even see if you are, if you have Hashimoto's, you need to look at T3, T4, reverse T3. There's so many other tests that you can do and thyroid's just one example. But let's say that um, someone's labs are quote unquote normal, but they're still feeling horrible, right? Labs don't, aren't always a great measure 
um, of long-term effects. They're good for short-term effects. And, and some labs, you know what, to be fair, some labs are good for long-term effects. A great example of this is hemoglobin A1C. That tells me if your blood sugar has been elevated for at least overall on average for three months, right? So that is a good long-term test. But that's why I do, you know, the gut test that I do and the hormone test that I do because it's more like time-lapse photography. You know, when I, when I test uh, urine tests for cortisol, I'm taking five samples over the course of 16 hours. So that's going to give me a real clear picture on what your diurnal rhythm looks like, your chronic stress, um, you know, whether or not you're even making cortisol, your adrenals burned out. Those things are long-term effects. They're not, they don't happen overnight at all. Mm. So I want to go back to you a little bit. So I know that you struggled with Epstein-Barr virus, mold, and mercury toxicity. Yeah. So in your experience with clients, how many of them have you found with similar health issues to those? And how does one find out if that's the cause? Yeah. So um, there was it was funny. There was a long period of time when I did get a lot of people. It's just probably because I was blogging about a lot at the time. So I attracted a lot of people with Epstein-Barr, um, with chronic immune dysfunction. So I definitely have treated a lot of people with that. Um, however, I'm not a mold expert. I, ha I am going through mold treatment now. I'm also going through Lyme treatment now. And for those people, I certainly refer out. That is not my zone of genius or expertise at all. So I can give, you know, diet support. I can tell you what's happening to your gut and to your hormones as a result. But often people have called me and I've said, get rid of the mold first and then we'll talk because mold really annihilates gut bacteria and Lyme tends to blow out your nervous system. And under both cases, you know, your cortisol curve is going to be pretty darn flat. And that's what happened with me. I was like, I lost my ability to tolerate heavy exercise. I would lift weights and, and crash so hard. I would immediately go to the sofa and nap. This happened to me visiting family. We were in Florida. We were going to go out to dinner. I was like, let me get in a workout. I went to the gym, lifted. And literally, I was like, I am nauseous and dizzy and feel like I can't even function. I went to the couch and fell right asleep. So... Um, you know, I knew I was like, okay, I think I have a toxin issue at that point. Um, but yes, yeah, some people, you know, I, I've gone through a lot of things that people have gone through. I've gone through childbirth. I've gone through training through at, at, and, and uh, breastfeeding. I breastfed for a year. I ran a marathon. So I certainly know all about sports and endurance training <laughs> and then dealing with chronic mystery illnesses that no one was able to diagnose until somebody was like, oh, dude, you've got, you know, Lyme. So it really, it's been a journey for sure. Um, and I'm going through, I'm perimenopausal now and on partial hormone replacement. I'm not on estrogen yet, but I'm on progesterone and DHEA. So does it help me to, um, uh, to have gone through these things personally myself? Yes, absolutely. It gives me insight and empathy. Um, but I also don't have to go through everything my people are going through to know how to treat and heal it. That's for sure. You can still, I still have helped many people. I don't have, for example, not with an autoimmune condition, but I've been treating it for treating them since I was trained in functional medicine. So as long as you have the knowledge and the research and you have other practitioners you can talk to, if you ever have a question, you can treat. You can treat people and know how to get well. And, and so much of getting well and healing is the basics. It really boils down to the basics. Chewing your food really well, digesting and absorbing your nutrients, eating really healthy, nutrient-dense foods, getting enough sleep, getting daily movement, surrounding yourself with people who inspire you, who are positive and having healthy relationships. You know, if you have those things lined up, you're going to treat and heal a lot of what's ailing you right then and there. So I ask a lot of people this question, um, and I want to know your take. What do you think about germ theory versus the terrain theory? The, you know, 
your environment makes you sick, because let's say you're a plant, for example, you're not getting adequate sun, your water is polluted, and now you're weak, and then bugs can attack you more. Do you think that's more likely the case, or is it just if you come in contact with something, it'll make you sick? That's a hard question to answer. I don't, um, you know, I, it's not the perspective I take when I'm treating people. I really do testing so I don't have to guess. You know, I always joke that I'm a dietitian, not a magician. So that's why I do stool testing. So I have hard numbers to look at. That's why I do hormone testing. So I have hard numbers to look at. So the question you asked is a very intelligent one. I just think it's unknowable to really know. Um, so I'm not sure. Well, if you had to just give your opinion, complete opinion, no backing, just what do you think? What would you say? I would say I don't I don't have an answer for you. I really again, I I don't anytime I assume anything about a person's well-being, I'm not usually, you know, I'm right a percentage of the time, but I really prefer to have empirical evidence first before I guess because um, that is much more of a driver in someone's treatment path and plan than just me saying, you know, theorizing and saying, I think it could be this. I'm not sure. It could be this. I, I really try to reserve judgment and just look at the data first. Okay, moving on. So <laughs> let's talk about the gut then. Which body processes are the gut responsible for? Every body process, <laughs> everything. I mean, you're, um, so when we're talking about the gut, I'm primarily talking about uh, small intestines, you know, stomach through small intestines. Of course, large intestines are involved, but small intestines where the rubber really meets the road. I mean, 70% of your immune, uh, of your lymph nodes line your small intestines. So immune function, hands down, but also, you know, trauma, um, genetics, nutrient absorption, all of those can influence the genes that are turned on or off to express themselves for illness. So for example, we all have the genes for cancer. That doesn't mean that they're going to be expressed. If you're absorbing your nutrients correctly, if your liver's functioning well, you decrease your likelihood for cancer. Um, if you're pooping every day, that's also extraordinarily beneficial. Um, so I, I, and the small intestine also produces 90% of your neurotransmitters of your serotonin and dopamine. So there is such a massive gut brain connection. In fact, um, I was just learning recently a new term called the psychobiome, and it's the term coined to connect our mood and, um, our neurotransmitter production with the certain gut bacteria. There, are, scientists have now been able to isolate specific gut bacteria where, if you're deficient, you can have more panic attacks, you can have depression, you can have anxiety, you can have ADHD. So, I think that whole field is super duper exciting. But if you want, I mean, my son was teasing me this morning, he's 14, he was like, I can handle all your clients, mom, just healthy gut is healthy brain. I was like, that's pretty much it. Because when you think about just how um, poor nutrient status affects your health, you know, it's, it's dramatic. We have an epidemic of people who are massively obese and severely undernourished at the same time. So if you just clean up your diet, fix your gut, so many other pieces fall into place. Your hormone balance, um, inflammation, migraines, depression, anxiety, ADHD, um, you know, just uh, bowel regularity, digestive function, chronic disease, chronic illness, all of those are affected by the gut. So what are some small steps everyone can take to improve gut health? So first of all, you want to make sure that about 90% of your diet is from nutrient-dense foods. And nutrient-dense foods are the ones without labels. They don't come in plastic packages that are really bright and shiny with 
an ingredient list longer than <laughs> your grocery list, basically. Um, so those are, you know, proteins from meat. And yes, meat, meat is one of the most nutrient dense foods on the planet. It's a great source of zinc and B12 and protein and iron. Um, so meat, ideally grass fed or pastured, uh, and organic eggs, poultry, chicken, turkey, um, wild game, things like venison, ostrich, buffalo, elk, rabbit, Cornish hens, harder to find in uh, the grocery stores, but certainly available online. Um, and then you have eggs. If you tolerate dairy, dairy is nutrient dense. And um, what am I leaving out here? Put fish, wild Alaskan salmon or, you know, wild caught seafood. Then you have your root vegetables, your potatoes, your sweet potatoes, your parsnips, turnips, uh, taro root, um, butternut, acorn, spaghetti, squash. You have your good quality fats, nuts, seeds, avocados, olives, and uh, coconut, and their oils as well, olive oil, coconut, coconut oil, butter. And then you have your produce, your fruits and veggies, and um, those are all super nutrient dense. So if somebody, if you take, and I know we are talking about small steps, but that's actually a huge step. If you, 90% of your diet is from real food, you're saving your own life. I love how Michael Pollan writes about um, the importance of cooking. He's like, if you just cook your meals at home, you're going to save your own life because those foods are proven to fight chronic disease, to fight inflammation. And I know after 27 plus years of practice, those foods heal. They heal people. People are getting radiantly and radically healthy eating those foods and able to get off medications, able to stop their heartburn medications, able to stop their anti-inflammatories, able to decrease. Um, I've had many patients get off antidepressants with the facilitation of their psychiatrist, of course. Um, but, you know, it's you're changing someone's life just starting there. That is just profound to me of how that changes someone's life. Eating fermented foods is another great way to really keep that healthy gut bacteria. So if you tolerate dairy, yogurt or kefir, but also um, uh, kimchi, sauerkraut, kombucha. Those are all beautiful fermented foods. Miso paste is a fermented food as well. So all of those are super nutritious. And then just being very careful with caffeine and booze also, especially as we age, our tolerance for both really decreases and interrupts our sleep a tremendous amount. So getting good sleep is also imperative for radiant health and your body does the most healing between 10 p.m and 2 a.m so i recognize not everyone's going to go to bed at 10 i usually am lights out i kind of start the process at 10 take off my makeup brush teeth read and meditate and lights out by 10 30. so um and trying to keep a consistent sleep schedule seven days a week so uh you know that your body is going to love the routine of it all. But good sleep, again, clears up brain fog, balances hormones, fixes a lot of gut inflammation and leaky gut, and just gives you a tremendous amount of energy and mental focus too. And I love how you didn't say, just be vegan, which a lot of people come on and they say, your, all your problems will be solved if you're vegan. Whereas I see a lot of vegans, even some of my close friends, that they just go to the inside aisles in the grocery store. Everything is in a box. Everything is highly processed. And they're like, well, there's no meat in it. I'm like, this is not food. <laughs> you're just eating a bunch of chemicals. That's right. You can be a French fry vegan is my joke. And just, yeah, eat fr mac and cheese is vegan. Vodka is vegan. So what? It doesn't mean anything. So, you, um, and yes, and, and for the record, listen, I have no attachments to, you know, if, if you follow a vegan diet, it's great short term. And I've actually, you know, certainly with Epstein-Barr or severe chronic viral issues or a fatty liver, I do have people go plant-based um, for a couple months, but long term, especially women, and especially when you're going through menopause, it's pretty much impossible to balance your blood sugar and your hormones without 
animal protein in there, your adrenals are just absolutely conked out. So you really need it. If you're detoxing or healing from a chronic condition, you really need the protein because without it, especially as you age, you lose a ton of muscle mass and you cannot balance your blood sugar. And muscle is the organ of longevity. So we know that aging, you know, uh, the biggest cause of death in the elderly population are bone fractures. And when you have a lot of muscle and you're strong and you're maintaining your balance, it's much harder to fall. Um, not only that, but muscle uh, is correlated with, you know, it's big piece of Alzheimer's prevention too. Alzheimer's is really type three diabetes. So you want to make sure that you're getting, you know, a good amount of protein in your diet to support uh, muscle, quite frankly. Okay. So you mentioned type three diabetes. I've only heard of types one and two. So what's yeah. type three? Type three is Alzheimer's and Alzheimer's disease starts, you know, a good 20 years before the symptoms really show up, right? Things just don't happen in your body. People say, I don't understand. One day she just got cancer. No, you've actually had cancer for a long time. Those cells have been working at that a long time. It just, by the time it's diagnosed, it's often late in the game. So Alzheimer's prevention, you want to think about, A, for women, um, estrogen replacement therapy, at hormone, bioidentical hormone replacement therapy is imperative. Most women get cognitive changes when estrogen levels fall and they experience brain fog, they experience memory loss, shifts in memory. So, uh, and, and menopause happens 20 years typically before Alzheimer's symptoms start showing up. So hormone replacement is extraordinarily beneficial, as is, you know, a really clean diet, a a healthy diet, protein-rich, nutrient-dense diet, low in sugar. So yeah, Alzheimer's is is type 3 diabetes where the sugar is is glycating in the brain and really causing the cells, cells to be a bit sticky and inflexible. So... Mark Hyman actually talks a lot about it. He does a wonderful job at it. So do you think that women who have maybe estrogen dominance would be a little bit more protected or it doesn't matter as soon as you go through menopause, it's going to crash? Correct. However, you need to make sure that if you do bioidentical hormone replacement, you know, this is again why I do extensive hormone testing in blood and urine because I want to make sure your detox pathways are proper so that you're not estrogen dominant. You know, if you're doing hormone replacement therapy, you want to make sure you're not becoming um, imbalanced in your, in your hormone state. But yes, once you go through menopause, I mean, your, your ovaries are producing estrogen and progesterone, pre-menopause, perimenopause, and then after menopause, your adrenals kick in and, and sputter a little bit for some last hurrahs, but it's, it's pretty minimal production. So when the party's over, it's over, baby. <laughs> and what do you find that women who have easy, breezy menopauses have done or what was their hormone pri- profile like before? That is a great question. You know, there's no there's no rhyme or reason to it uh, per se uh, individually as a population. I can tell you people who are more physically active, metabolically lean, have more muscle tissue, are typically going to stay leaner and not gain what feels like 20 pounds overnight, for sure. I mean, and also having a healthy gut is imperative. The better your gut health is going into menopause, the better it will be on the other side of it. Because... When you go through menopause, you have a lot of changes to the lining of your gut. As your estrogen and progesterone decline, the mucous membrane that lines your small intestine really decreases. Your gut becomes, uh, the gut wall becomes more semi-permeable. You develop a leaky gut and bloating and again, brain fog and fatigue, food sensitivities to gluten and dairy are big ones. So, um, you know, if your gut wall has really strong integrity going in, you've got a much better fighting chance. Um, And you also detox estrogen much better when you're pooping regularly, when you really have good gut and liver function, for sure. 
So for a lot of women, I noticed that poor gut health seems to always go with hormonal imbalance. So why do you think the hormones are imbalanced in the first place? Do you think it could be more genetic, environmental, diet related? So first of all, you want to look at how your body's interfacing with the environment. So there are millions and millions of women on all sorts of birth control, okay? Birth control suppresses ovulation. It suppresses hormone production. So let's say you're a woman who had a regular period, super painful periods, you have PCOS, endometriosis. Your doctor says, take the birth control pill. It's really not the proper treatment um, for those conditions because you're just suppressing your body's own production of estrogen, of progesterone. And for some women, they came back no problem. Like some women can be on the pill from ages 16 to 27. They go off the pill, boom, the next month they're pregnant. We all know someone like that. But a lot of women really struggle to get pregnant and then they have to go on IVF and then their periods don't really regulate you know, from there on, and I have to put people on, you know, hormones even before their perimenopausal just and on a lot of herbs and fix the adrenals and the gut just to kind of bring the regular cycles back. So I'm sorry, what was the first part of your question? I'm not, I'm not answering all of it is, oh, what's the cause of hormone imbalances to begin with? Okay. Chronic stress is a huge one, um, especially for progesterone, chronic adrenal stress really tanks your uh, your progesterone production and you need a robust production of progesterone every month to even ovulate. So chronic stress. Now, what does chronic stress look like? Chronic stress looks like being on your iPad in bed till the minute you get to sleep. I just saw a research study this week that showed um, it was in rats but the implications for human were very strong where the exposure to the electromagnetic frequencies coming from Wi-Fi and 5G technology, by the way, is military grade. It's not meant to be in civilians' homes next to their heads in bed. So exposure thickens the walls of the adrenal cortex so you, and it raises cortisol levels, especially if you're someone who sleeps with a phone next to your head cortisol levels are elevated while you sleep. That is putting your body into chronic stress. Um, you're working all the time. You're not quieting your mind down. You're not meditating. You're not spending time outdoors in nature. You have a stressful job on someone else's deadline or you're parenting full time and just don't have a lot of help or support. All of those are big drivers of hormone imbalances. And then yes, too much caffeine and booze not enough good quality protein and fat. And we, oh my gosh, we as women need fat, especially if you're trying to um, get good quality eggs for fertility, or if you have PCOS, you know, the right fats will, will help. Fats are precursors and cholesterol in particular is a precursor to hormones. Fats make estrogen, they make progesterone, they make testosterone. So the right fats are imperative. Olive oil, avocados, butter, nuts and seeds, olives, which olives are a prebiotic food too, by the way. Um, so at caviar, fatty fish, you know, oils, those are really, really nutritious. What is very poor in nutrients and will really upset your delicate hormone balance are the processed fats, things like canola oil, even if it's organic, guys, soybean oil, cottonseed oil, sunflower oil, safflower oil, anything hydrogenated, those are all very toxic um, and will displace healthy fats. Um, Omega-3s from cold water fatty fish, that's another good, good fat for you. So you want to make sure you've got the right fatty acid balance and getting enough good pro protein. That will also help support hormonal balance too. But if you're following a really low fat diet, your hormones are, and your PMS is going to be really pretty wicked for sure. Yeah. I had someone come on the podcast to talk about EMFs and there are some things to do. Thankfully, like he suggested having a kill switch for your bedroom installed so that you could turn it off at night. So at least your bedroom doesn't have any electronics going. That's right. The bedroom is for sleeping and sex. That's it. No Wi-Fi, no phones. 
If you have to, because I always get this question, um, if you have to have it on, let's say you have a teenager out driving, you're a caregiver for a parent or a spouse, and you have to have it on, sleep with it a minimum of 10 feet away from your head, but don't put it near your head at all. So which tests can we get done to determine whether or not our hormones are in balance? Uh, A couple of things. One is I do blood tests. I do comprehensive thyroid panels. I look at vitamin D. I look at uh, fasting insulin and glucose. I'll also look at red blood cell magnesium and zinc. I'll do um, a comprehensive CBC. I'll look at folate and B12. So those are just foundations you need. Um, Then I, and I'll, I'll also look at inflammatory markers lipoprotein A, C-reactive protein. Those are very telling in and of themselves, and I'll look for um, ANA and autoimmune markers. But then going deeper and delving deeper, I do a Dutch test complete, and this tells me your body's production and detoxification of hormones. So this is really important because, um, again, I it enables me to see okay, whether or not you're making decent amounts of estrogen and if they're going down the pro-inflammatory, the 4-OH or the 16-OH pathways, which will cause you a lot of issues with estrogen dominance, things like weight gain, breast tenderness, moodiness, irritability, fluid retention, migraines potentially. Um, So that's very telling. I will also, it enables me to look at the ratios of estrogen to progesterone and what your balance is like. Um, and testosterone as well. Women need testosterone too. Um, It's very, very important for maintaining a lean body mass. I'll also look at your DHEA levels. I look at your um, production of morning and metabolized cortisol because that paints a very clear picture of what your stress is like. For example, you know, I, I have some people who are literally off the charts, either just work stress is really high or they're drinking just tons of espresso to get through the day. <laughs> That's like a classic example where I see someone's cortisol off the chart. Or I see people who are absolutely rock bottom. They start off high after their morning coffee, then they go do their Peloton. And at 3 p.m., they are just crashed and burned, irritable, weepy, exhausted, and grabbing another Starbucks to get through that second part of the day. Um, and then I also look at, again, neurotransmitter production. And I can see if you're deficient in certain B vitamins, if you're making your serotonin and dopamine, if you're producing melatonin. So it enables me to give you a really clear picture of what's happening and give you a specific roadmap as to how to heal that. Maybe you need carbs at night. Maybe you're under eating. I have a lot of women who are working out very hard and not eating enough calories or carbs. So I often have to diet people up. And I see this in women who have done um, keto or super low carb for long periods of time. And their adrenals just, they're not not functioning. And the thyroid is really shut down. And you need enough carbs to convert the uh, T4 into the active form of thyroid hormone, which is T3. So I can also see like, if their cortisol is really bad in the afternoon, you know, usually the thyroid is involved in there too. So I'll, I'll start with simple shifts like increasing someone's thyroid, uh, pardon me, increasing someone's carb intake, especially at night. So they sleep really well. Their thyroid is starting to upregulate again. Um, and I'll also do some nice adaptogenic adrenal herbs like ashwagandha, um, passion flower, those are uh, holy basil, rhodiola. Those are all really restorative. And licorice can actually raise and sustain cortisol levels because it increases the half-life of cortisol. So it helps the active form of cortisol stay, uh, stay active for longer periods of time. So your energy is more sustained during the day. You're not crashing and you get a much better diurnal rhythm. So your energy is good during the day. And then at night you sleep beautifully. So the treatments are simple, but I also do things like tell people to get off coffee and I'll put them on an adaptogenic drink. Um, 
I don't receive money from this company. I just really like it. It's called Four Sigmatic. And they have a cordyceps and cacao blend where cordyceps is a mushroom. Again, that gives good mental focus and endurance. Um, but without the caffeine, it tastes really pleasant, actually, so that you get good mental function and can perform without that coffee jitteriness and um, without impacting your sleep at night. Yeah, that sounds like a lot of the herbs that I'm taking. Oh, good. Yeah. And how do you feel on them? I feel pretty good and it's kind of weird. <laughs> but I, <laughs> I do know years before I figured out the coffee was a no-go. So I've been off coffee for quite some time. And I notice all my friends are like, I can have coffee. It doesn't bother me. But I notice it totally bothers them. <laughs> it makes them so much more irritable. They're yelling yes. in traffic. I mean, I can see it, but, you know, not everyone wants to admit it. But unfortunately, as delicious as it is, it affects a lot of women. Oh, it does. But, you know, I don't drink coffee, but I still yell in traffic. So I don't know what my excuse is <laughs> other than I think I was a race car driver in my past life. But yeah, no, but it does. And it really, the coffee really worsens PMS too. I mean, if you, and, and when you're going through perimenopause and menopause, you can get these ragey days you're also. So it really impacts that. Yeah. So if you're staying there holding a smoking gun, you're like, oh, maybe I shouldn't have had that second cup of coffee. <laughs> yes. And in Miami, everybody loves their coffee. So everyone's a little yeah. on edge here. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I, I have noticed that, um, when I started switching to matcha, it actually got a lot better because mm. matcha has a little bit less caffeine and it doesn't have the spike as much. So it's better, but I still have to make sure I drink it early so it doesn't affect my sleep. Yeah, I found for me, matcha made me very, very jittery. I couldn't tolerate it at all. So, um, but yeah, I've never been a big caffeine drinker, but that, I don't know, matcha did me in too. Who knows? <laughs> Well, I do put all my tinctures, the, the passion flower, ashwagandha, everything in the matcha. So that could be why oh, it's not that's so bad. Probably, yeah, that's probably why. That makes sense. So what are some other maybe diet changes that women can do to help balance hormones and, of course, like get more regular? Mm -hmm. um, again, really figuring out – so my fourth – book is called Cave Women Don't Get Fat. And it really is wonderful. It's a paleo diet book for women, um, which is extraordinarily hormone balancing because it will support your adrenals and thyroid. It's not a low carb diet by any means, but it helps you find your own unique carb tolerance. Everyone has a different carb tolerance. Okay. And everyone, uh, that varies the first two weeks of your cycle versus the last two weeks of your cycle. So this is a really important tip. The first two weeks of your cycle, you're much more insulin sensitive. You can handle some extra carbs without the weight gain. You're not really craving. Uh, you can handle harder workouts. You're more resilient. Your brain is happy. You're not irritable because your progesterone and estrogen are higher. Once your progesterone and estrogen peak mid-cycle and then start to fall, that's when it all hits the fan and you become more insulin resistant, more irritable, more moody. There's that two days where you just feel like you could snort a line of chocolate chips off the counter and pretty much face plant into a trough of ice cream or potato chips. So um, those weeks you want to make sure, and those couple days in particular, you really want to double up on your protein, okay? To support your adrenals, take the edge off the cravings and the blood sugar swings that you're getting. What most people don't realize is, and women especially, you need about four to six ounces in the, at every meal, but especially in the morning because it levels off your blood sugar for four to six hours after you eat it. So imagine, right, you start off like this morning, I had two eggs and about three ounces of tuna fish, right? And then I had banana with some peanut butter. Very exciting. Um, but, you know, that like if I didn't have that protein, I would never function or be mentally clear and I'd be craving and hungry. When I get that protein, then I can last till lunch. You know, my breakfast is at like 7.15. I don't eat lunch till 12.30. 
one and I'm okay, I'm not hungry or irritable. So it makes a big difference when you're balancing your hormones, you've got to eat with your cycles and find your own carb tolerance. You may tolerate more in the beginning of your cycle, less in the end, or you may find, you know, as your period approaches, you do need a little more carbs to kind of get your sleepy, relaxed, you know, serotonin and dopamine up, especially at night. Yeah. One thing that I found for me was that when I started eating breakfast, things got better, which Mm -hmm. is crazy because fasting is such a big uh, trend now. And everybody's like, oh, just fast, fast as long as possible, fast weeks. And I found the opposite. The more I eat earlier in the day, actually, and stop eating maybe around seven or so, the better I feel. Yeah. And get bear in mind too, and this I talk about in Cave Women too, I have a section on intermittent fasting. Of the 73 studies I look at, only 13 were done on women. Okay. Women are far more sensitive to the effects of fasting. If you have a thyroid condition or your adrenals are weak, your cortisol curve is shot, by all means, do not fast. You will do more harm than good. And women should not do prolonged fast for more than five to seven days. Now, if you want to do a gentle fast, like a 12-hour fast, where your dinner finishes at seven and you don't have breakfast till seven in the morning, that is usually well tolerated by most people and can is enough to facilitate weight loss. But you don't need to fast, you know, 16 hours a day or uh, even 14 hours a day can be detrimental to a lot of people. So it really depends on you, where you are in your cycle. Now, The people, the population I work with the most who has the best success in fasting are women who are done with menopause because you're not getting the monthly fluctuations in your hormones. So things are leveled off. And especially if you're doing hormone replacement, your hormone intake is going to be the same every day. Yeah. I did hear that a lot of the studies that were done on men and and post-menopausal women. So. Exactly. So listen to your body, people. I mean, your body keeps the score. It's wise beyond measure. So if you feel shaky and irritable and you know you have to eat, then intermittent fasting is not for you. It's just that simple. And There are plenty of other ways to skin a cat. There really are. And you mentioned shaky and irritable. So what are some foods that you can eat or try to eat and see if they don't make you shaky and irritable after, like so people don't go up and down all day. As I mentioned, just optimizing your protein intake is really, really key. Getting good quality fats, again, because protein and fats really sustain your blood sugar and have zero to no impact on your insulin levels. Um, You may find, again, you have to find your own unique carb tolerance. You may be somebody who likes and needs a couple bites of starch at every meal to sustain your blood sugar. Protein and carbs and veggies may not be enough for you. Or you may find you really do far better on a very low-carb diet where your carbs are primarily from vegetables and a piece of fruit here and there. So it's really unique. Um as to the recommendation. So ultimately it's each of our responsibility. Take a little time, be your own diet detective experiment. Like, do I need carbs at any meal? Do I need it at one meal? If so, what meal is that? Is it closer to the time of my workout or is it closer to the time of my bed? Or do I kind of need a little at every meal or do I only have at breakfast, you know, fruit at breakfast and, you know, rice or potatoes at dinner? Because if I have a carb at lunch, I'm sleepy after work. You know, so it re- or sleepy in the afternoon while I'm working. So it really depends on, uh, you know, again, your own unique biochemistry. And how long on average does it take to balance hormones once, uh, once somebody commits to the diet, the lifestyle changes, maybe the supplements and all that? Yeah, well, it's, I really try to um, manage people and tell them, you know, it's a minimum of, three to six months. Um, If you have PCOS and you're not getting your period regularly, you know, it can take longer to bring back a period. But fortunately, fortunately, you know, I have found with many of my clients, and this is pretty funny, it brings it back unexpectedly quickly, even when we just shift the diet. And so I had a client, Deanna, who was told she could never have children. Her boyfriend broke up with her. It was actually really heartbreaking. 
And she didn't, she hadn't gotten her period for nine years prior. And within a month of working together and shifting her diet, she got her period. So we just were like laughing hysterically because she was told by her doctor, you know, you're fully menopausal. And, and she wasn't actually menopausal. She was not. And we did her Dutch test and she wasn't menopausal. She just had a lot of imbalances and was overweight and had a lot of insulin management issues. So, um, you know, again, I, I had another client who came to me for um, fertility. She was not getting pregnant. She was like, let me just see what happens when we switched her diet. We switched her diet. And I mean, she was a very, very picky eater and had a very limited repertoire of food. So I started just adding a few foods in and with six and within six weeks, she was pregnant. I mean, so... <laughs> It depends on your on your body, but I say give a minimum of three to six months, especially the longer you've had a problem, the longer it will take, but we do get there. And in women who are postmenopausal, once you put people on hormone replacement, that's relatively quick because it's a controlled experiment. You're not getting a monthly cycle. So you're just, you know, refilling the tank. So I see a much quicker turnaround. Um, and so women who are going from night sweats and insomnia and hot flashes, moody irritability and vaginal dryness to um, sleeping, like within a, a couple days to a week, sleeping, the brain fog clears, the moodiness resolves, of course, because you're sleeping. The hot flashes decrease significantly um, there's vaginal moisture, you know, I use, uh, I also use inserts, estriol inserts. So, um, you know, there's so much you can do. Uh, and then for menstruating women, you know, I'll pull out my biggest guns, right? Obviously a really amazing diet supplements as needed. Um, sometimes some topical progesterone as needed. And we just, Hit the, and, and it's really restoring the monthly cycle. You know, if, if a woman is young and menstruating, but having like 21 day cycles, we elongate them so that they, you know, spread out to a 28 day cycle again. Or a woman who's not menstruating, we bring her cycle back every month. So how can everyone learn from you and work with you? Tell us about your books and your practice. Yeah. So I have four books out. Um, the first three are my pink Bibles. Eat, drink, can be gorgeous. The, the motto is your body may be a temple, but who says it can't be a nightclub? So this is great for the girl in her 20s who's really trying to just find balance and get healthy and be able to, you know, have a martini at night and some wheatgrass by day. And what are the good supplements? What, what food does she need to eat? What supplements can she take to balance out her hormones, her energy? Um, there's a, a lot about sexual health in there as well, which is really fun to write about. Um, and then the other the books, two and three are offshoots of that. There's meal plans. There's um, again, different supplement protocols, there's food logs in them. Cave women don't get fat is my, uh, paleo diet book for women, as I mentioned. So if people want to work with me, definitely. So for five of your listeners, Kat, um, I actually have opened up my calendar for a 30 minute consultation. This is to help you solve three specific or pardon me, to help you solve a specific problem where you come away with three customized strategies. So if you're trying to lose weight, you're trying to balance your hormones, you're trying to, uh, you know, fix your gut, uh, definitely go to estherblum.com forward slash call, C-A-L-L. -L. You can also, while you're on my website, Esther Blum, you can download, I have a three-part free video training series called Crush Your Cravings. So you can download that. I'm on Instagram at Gorgeous Esther. I'm on YouTube at Esther Blum. So there's a lot of information I try to give and produce and share with you all so you become educated and empowered when it comes to your own health. So before we go, is there anything that you'd like to leave our listeners with? Any other little tips or tricks? 
just understanding that there is nothing in you that cannot be healed. I always say with the exception of, you know, type one diabetes and amputations, uh, you know, surgical procedures, I cannot reverse. Okay. But um, for the most part, if you're having imbalances, know that there are answers for you. And if your doctor isn't listening, find a new doctor, find a functional medicine practitioner, find a dietitian, an integrative dietitian like me, find someone who is going to run tests, who's going to look deeper under the hood, who's going to get to the root cause of your problem. Because I guarantee you, you know, your uh, PMS is not a birth control deficiency. It's a nutrient deficiency. It's, um, you know, it's an imbalance in your life, in your stress, your lifestyle, poor diet, poor nutrient absorption or gut inflammation. You fix those things, your PMS is going to resolve. So the answers are inside of you. So there are answers, uh, uh, you know, on the outside to help you unearth that wisdom in your body. Well, Esther, thank you so much for your time. And I will put all of that in the show notes so everyone can go and check you out. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me.